Uh, welcome to uh, webinar 45, and I think that uh, tells a story in itself, webinar 45. That's uh, a long time since we uh, started our webinar series, and uh, this month, uh, uh, after our summer break here in the UK, is the Intelligent Airfield. Now, tools, time, training, etc. is is required to ensure, to maintain safe and compliant visual aids. And what I would uh, introduce now is the, uh, the webinar team of today. Uh, it's our renowned uh, uh, friend and, uh, and uh, expert in the field, uh, Tony Smith. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much. I would also uh, welcome Carl from across the pond, as we say here in the UK. And... Uh, from a specialist in the uh, in the FAA uh, infrastructure with half a century, well, that's it, Carl. Eh? Half a century, eh? In in the industry, um, myself, uh, uh, I've been around uh, equally as long, I think, as Carl. So probably you can tell by my white hair. Uh, and uh, Kevin, Kevin Burbridge, who and Tony Coates, who recently has uh, uh, joined the TMS uh, uh, training solutions team and bring them with uh, bring with them a, a host and a range of uh, uh, experiences in aviation and in the industrial sector. And I think so, uh, that's good. And we'll say, uh, Robert, uh, Managing Director of TMS Training Solutions, uh, TMS, and uh, who is actually on the road at the moment, so is uh, joining us out of office. So, uh, uh, Seward uh, Ford, uh, unfortunately, it appears he cannot be with us today, but although we've got him down as part of the webinar team, Seward himself as a specialist mm -hmm. consultant uh, uh, with a literally a lifetime of AGL knowledge uh, in, in specifically in uh, the North America and the FAA world. So welcome. Uh, what we're going to do is to introduce ourselves in terms of the, uh, the subject of intelligent mm -hmm. airfield. What do we mean by intelligent airfield? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said earlier, tools, time, training, etc., is required mm -hmm. to be able to design, to install, to maintain, to operate, the uh, uh, AGL, and we are part of a wider aviation uh, in engineering network. And you will, some of you will recall, and hopefully for now, webinar 18, uh, two years ago, and it's over two years ago, two, two and a half years ago, we actually talked about runway to recovery following uh, uh, what we thought was the end of COVID. And uh, Basically, now we are talking really is to say time has moved on. We need to revisit. Technology is moving forward. And uh, so we'd like to introduce you now to compliance and competency in airfield, airfield engineering through the digital, digitalization age, and we call it Airport 4. So let's not forget about AGL, aeronautical ground lighting. Many call it airfield ground light. It's a crucial part of the wider aviation and airfield infrastructure. It's used to guide aircraft, to visually guide aircraft, to take off, landing, taxiing, especially for low visibility conditions. And I'll say especially because that's when we really need to ensure that the system is operating effectively and efficiently. These systems play a critical uh, role, and we need, though, to adhere to very, very strict engineering standards and regulations so that we've got a reliable and safe operation. The engineering status of AGL refers to design, as I said, installation, operation, and maintenance within this pretty much a very highly regulated uh, specialized field. And the drawings that you, the, the diagrams that you see show that we are part of a wider aviation network, as I mentioned. 
But the key aspects associated with the engineering status of AGI, let us consider the standards. Where, where, where is the regulatory and the compliance framework? IKO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, IKO Annex 14, so there are 19 annexes, but Annex 14 is specifically uh, uh, associated with the infrastructure on the airfield, that is the visual aids, for example, markings, there is a visual aid, where illuminated with lights. EASA is the European Union Aviation Safety a Agency, which covers the whole of the European community nations, and there are national standards. And I've given an example here of the UK. The Civil Aviation Publication 168 is standard for the UK. If we're going to Australia, the CASA, the CASA documentation and MOS 139. And so each of the national uh, 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 authorities will have their own national standards, which is basically a mirror image of IKO Annex 14 with local requirements, local editions, etc. The other aspect is when it comes to the equipment itself, the IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, which is based in Switzerland, then issue documents. And the document associated with primarily with the competence, etc., associated with AGL, then is, is for us in the UK, is a British standard. It's a European norm standard, 61821. So let's take Airport 4, the intelligent air field through engineering digital, digitalization. The engineering disciplines, well, there's electrical engineering that we have to consider, the civil engineering, there's mechanical engineering, and then overall, in today's ten age, it's systems engineering. So we are putting the together based upon electrical, civil, and mechanical engineering. So systems engineering and systems engineering is actually covering things such as uh, uh, the follow the green technology, the ILC uh, MS, which is the individual light control and monitoring, uh, which basically then enables surface movement drive and scent control. So AGL's is critical, as I mentioned earlier. Here in TMS Training Solutions, we aim to guide our customers and the wider aviation family through the maze of the standards and to successfully identify, design, install, maintain, measure the compliance of these critical visual aids. And we hope to do this with our practical guide and support. But for everybody else, everybody in the industry, we must all identify technology advances because technology moves forward and we must be able to utilize the technology advantages in both design, installation, you know, uh, uh, supply, installation, maintenance, etc., etc. And one of the aspects which we uh, which is very interesting at the moment, is the subject of the PAPI. And Tony Smith, uh, who is the developer and the, the designer of the PAPI, is on our panel. And PAPI in itself has changed. We've gone from incandescent lighting to LED lighting. There has been some changes. And uh, the nature of, uh, of LEDs is fundamental. where the light and how the light is generated is different to a heat element, which is basically an incandescent light. So we've got to understand equipment and how, how we get a light output, because that is what a visual aid is. It is an illuminated visual aid. So when we're looking at the intelligent airfield, and when we're looking at looking forward and utilizing technology advantages, we're looking at the operational and the engineering compliance, then what are factors? Now I've listed a few factors down here. This is not exhaustive. But looking forward, we've got to think about runway and taxiway light monitoring and the maintenance of it. 
we've got to think about how we're going to do it. So can we predict, if we get data, we can predict what Nathan was is needing. And the, the fixtures themselves, the light fixtures themselves, the power, that technology has moved on. We have lights now which are quite smart in, 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 in what they can do uh, and, and information that they can give us. We need to be able to utilize the, the artificial light, uh, intelligence, the internet of things, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to, to check and survey the performance of the light equipment, where the equipment is installed, so that we can get data. So basically, going forward, our future in AGL operation and in maintenance and serviceability will be driven by the data we collect. So which, uh, and, and, and we all know we're in this era of the green uh, 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 era. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have to take due considerations about that uh, in terms of how AGL is designed, et cetera, et cetera. To collect data, we've got to have a software package. So there are maintenance tools available, maintenance management tools available now. But in all this, there are people, there are us. And so we need to be able to ensure that we're competent, we understand, we can utilize the tools, et cetera, et cetera, all in accordance to meet the international and the regulatory uh, uh, standards, both international, regional, national, et cetera. So what does it mean for us looking forward? Well, it means for us looking forward that we've got to do regular inspections, whatever those inspections are. Some people call them audits. So audits for operational reasons, audits for engineering reasons. It's a comprehensive evaluation of processes of design, systems, projects, etc. It involves assessing the integrity, the efficiency, the compliance of the engineering activities and that infrastructure within the airfield. Because we want to identify where there are potential improvements to ensure that safety is maintained and reduce risk to the absolute min minimum. Unfortunately, aviation is a risk. And those aircraft are not always sat on the ground, are they? They're air taxis. They go in the sky and they land. They take off and they land and they taxi. That is a risk. There is an element of risk there. So I would ask you all, in your airport, do you currently comply? Do you, can you justify that compliance? Let's have a look at some of the inspections the kind of inspections, structural audits are carried out, inspections are carried out on the infrastructure, the pavement, etc. We put our lights in the pavement. Are those lights secure in the pavement? We look at the energy audits. Can we save power? And so when we're looking at the power supply of AGL, can we generate, can we justify the power the move from incandescent to LEDs is a power saving. We've got to do audits associated with the procedures, the processes that we do. The projects, before they become operational, they need to be checked. Are we under, uh, ensuring that the projects are operating within the budgets, etc.? So when it comes to the engineering side, the AGL engineering side, then pre-project audits, ongoing audits, and then audits through the line. The regulator needs to be satisfied that we, on an airfield, are performing our function according to our job. AGL is basically support an aircraft on a taxiway network, on a runway for landing and takeoff. So are our equipments 
operating according to the standard. That's what inspections and audits and ongoing maintenance is all about. So how do we conduct engineering and maintenance audits? So let's have a look at four specific areas. First of all, what have we got installed out in the field? We have power, somebody is controlling, and we have these light fixtures, light fixtures in taxiways, light fixtures in the approach, light fixtures on the run associated with the runway. So are they being correctly installed? Is it the correct equipment for the location, for the job function it's got to do? And are they, are they performing to the standard? But to enable us to ensure we can do that, then we need tools and equipment. We have test equipment that is calibrated within the time frame. The generic time scale is every year, for example. Have we got adequate working space? Have we got storage for our equipment? Have we got the correct percentage of spare parts? What about the technical manuals for the equipment that we have. When we're looking at the actual inspection programs, the, the, the routine maintenance, the breakdown maintenance, do we have records associated with those and the work orders attached to those tasks to ensure that the equipment is in good condition and is correctly adjusted? No point in having a light fixture that is pointing in the wrong direction, for example, or the wrong colour. So when we're looking at an inspection and audit, that aspect is looked at. So when we take those three elements, who's actually doing it? We are human beings. So do we have trained staff? Do they have a thorough knowledge? of the equipment, the system that they have to work with. Control, power, and equipment in the field. Because the nature of AGL as an electrical engineering system, then we have voltages out there, the electrical voltages out there, in excess of a thousand volts, which means safe working procedures must be in place. So do we have experience with higher voltage um, uh, electrical supply. So those are the four issues, insulation and material, tools and equipment, inspection programs, and personnel. So now let's sort of look a little bit deeper into the airport. Why don't you, why or do you employ an independent person? Someone who is not associated with your day-to-day -day running will come in and take a clean view of, and that's what an inspection or an audit is. The regulator will come in and have a window of time to check key points and say, yes, I believe you are fit for purpose. But someone will needs really in advance, whether it's the maintenance manager, management or an independent surveyor of some description, then who we'll look at those four areas of the install base, the tools and equipment, the documentation and procedures, and you and us as the people. And therefore you can receive a written report to justify. Now that written report would have an executive summary, which is an introduction to the, the technical inspection or audit, the scope that, that it covers, and a summarized and some recommendations. And then with some supporting documentation in the form of appendices or annexes. So what's in an a, a standard AGL? I think we all recognize that the standard AGL in years, the past years, has been a 6.6 based system. It's a constant current system and there's three basic blocks to, to consider. There's the control, so they're the command and the monitoring 
of how the system works uh, and uh, uh, the power, which traditionally had been a CCR, that has now changed to that CCR from a Irista based unit through to a uh, uh, an IGBT, a transistor based unit. So things have changed there. Out in the field, we've gone from constant halogen to LEDs. So when we package that together and we look at the different comp three component parts that are showing their control, uh, uh, power and field circuit, the distribution side, then let us have a look at those three. But basing it on electrical, mechanical and civil engineering elements. One thing we must remember AGL, that visual aid, is an asset. It's an asset to that airfield. It's an asset as part of that wider aviation network to support air travel. So let's consider, let's consider power, control, distribution, and then the supporting tools and equipment and the documentation and procedures. One of the things I said I'm going to start with is power. Our power and the CCR has been associated with the IEC. The IEC provide the technical specifications for the equipment. The International Electrotechnical Commission based in Switzerland. Now, IEC now is re-looking at all the IEC documents associated with AGL and is now going to, which is proposed, and it is ongoing, that IEC 61820 will have different chapters and will consume some of the older IEC documents within those chapters. For example, power. The IEC 61820, then with chapter three will be, uh, so chapter two uh, 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 will be uh, uh, talking about the power unit. Is it a CCR? Are there alternatives to a CCR? Yes, there are. There are alternatives in the form of a power electronic converter, or a PEC, as it's commonly called. But traditionally, we've had this CCR. A CCR was delivering either 12 amps or 20 amps, or uh, uh, more regularly, 6.6 .6 amps. And that's been the standard. But there are other values associated. It's not just a 6.6 .6 amp, so there are lower current uh, power units as well. So thinking about those, and this is where the technology has really moved forward. The standards are now catching up with the technology that is available from some suppliers. When we look at control, control has come from hardwire control. You know, uh, so so the communication is across hard wire. Then we we into the the era of the the fiber optic that's been around for quite some time. We when we're looking at how the the data, the volume of data to be able to switch on and switch off and monitor, etc. The lighting lighting systems. Then we've gone from the computer control, the PLC control system. We're now into the network switching. And this diagram I'm going to show here is just a typical, typical infrastructure diagram. But when we look at the infrastructure, the architecture of a control system, the modern control system, we basically have looked at four key areas. We've looked at safety when we look at the, the newer generation. We try to remove accidental usage by an air traffic controller. The controller is the person who operates the lighting system up in the control tower. That is a stressful job. So we want to be able to build in as much safety to enable that controller to be able to not make a mistake. We want the equipment to be reliable, the control, so that when we select a lighting system of a particular intensity, et cetera, et cetera, then does it work? 
So to be able to do that, we've made it modular. But it also needs to be customer friendly. So a lot of work has gone into the customer friendly side. Now we know very well that uh, when we're looking at uh, the, the air traffic control center, for example, now we've got remote controls towers. So we're part of that overall advancement. When I look at the equipment in the field, how do we use lights? Well, increasingly, increasingly, with the reliability of the lighting fixtures, then we want to be able to move an aircraft from the runway to its parking position, or from the parking position when he gets permission to push back and then start his engines, to be able to go back to the runway holding position to go onto the runway for takeoff. That's called follow the green technology. So we use lighting, we use the taxiway center lights. How do we do that? The technology is the individual light control and monitoring. When we look at those lighting fixtures themselves, the lighting fixtures now kind, we have smart lights. And what I mean by smart lights, if it's a bi-directional light, we can actually monitor the light and switch on different directions whether it's that, you know, to the left or to the right, on a bi-directional light, we can monitor and we can also give the particular light direction an idea in a smart light. So technology is moved on. When we're looking at the ILCMS, the individual light control, how do we switch a light on and off? Well, power line communication has been around for quite a long time. That has had a lot of challenges. It is now becoming more reliable. And that's because of technology advances. I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but I'm just identifying these are uh, elements associated with an intelligent airfield infrastructure. When we're looking at the light source itself, we've gone from tungsten halogen to LED. 20 years LED's been around. I was involved 20 years ago with the introduction of uh, that first generation and the analysis of why were they not performing what we thought, the way that we thought they were going to. But an LED is a totally different look. Where an LED then emits light in a wavelength, a few different colours. It's different wavelengths. You get short wavelengths, narrow wavelengths, and wider wavelengths. Fundamental different to a to a, a heat source, which is basically uh, uh, what an incandescent light is. So it's totally different. It's more efficient. More efficient. Well, if you have inefficiency with a incandescent light, that inefficiency was felt by heat. We don't have that with an LED. So if we're, depending on the, the area of the world that we, we, we're operating in, we have to do something about it. That also means that there's no really, uh, no IR infrared signal coming from an LED. So night vision and things like that has been affected. We also have a, a, an understanding that when we look at an LED, then to the human being, it looks clearer, it's brighter, the color looks more richer, etc. Et but it does deteriorate as we age. And that deterioration is important for us to have an appreciation. But the life expectancy of an LED, 50,000 plus hours compared to maybe 3,000 hours for a tungsten halogen at 6.6 amps. So when we're looking at LED technology, then there are three areas of, of performance that we need to be looking at. If an LED is going to fail, it generally fails not long after it's been installed and switched on. So it has its early life failure. 
And then, well, he'll get it past that early light failure, and it may be uh, not the LED itself, it could be its driver, etc. But that early light failure, it's going to fail, tends to be early in life. Then you get a stable period. But then you start to get color shift, etc. So there is an end of life. So there's the three uh, periods of the life expectancy of an LED. Here is a, a, a little diagram which can give you kind of some bits of information associated with the performance criteria between a halogen-based uh, and an LED-based lighting fixture. Not going to go through the details. We've been through this before. But I'm identifying these are technology advances that we need to have some halogen with LED. Let's have a look at out in the field. Let's have a look at, for example, a 6.6 .6 amp system. We've still got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of airports operating 6.6 .6 amp systems around the world. How does the 6.6 .6 amp system work? It's a constant current system. And that means that the same current has to be delivered to each light. So the illumination, the candela output, is exactly the same from each of the lights. Hopefully. And to do that, we have a primary circuit and then a secondary circuit. And that primary circuit is made up of cable, transformers, a light is then connected to that transformer. To connect the transformer to the cable are connectors. So we've got 100 lights, we've got 100 transformers, generally speaking. 100 transformers with two connectors is in and then out. They've got 200 connectors. And what I always say, waiting to fail. Why waiting to fail? Maybe because the connectors are not very good. Or maybe they've not been installed. But they do have to be installed. So connectors have to be installed out in the field, not on a bench in a workshop. Well, that's easy to do in comparison to hanging over transformer pit maybe in cold conditions or hot conditions. Maybe at night, when we are not very efficient. So we as the human being create most of the issues associated with connectors. But then having said that, when we're looking at the connectors and when we're looking at any connection out in the field, then how do we, how do we protect from water ingress? Because where's the equipment? It's in the ground. And frequently underwater. But we've got to make sure that we, we protect against that water in, ingress. And there are different ways, depending whether we're in a temperate climate, where I live, where I'm talking from now is the UK. That's a, pretty much a, a humid temperate climate. If I go to the north, or I go way to the south, we're in Arctic or Antarctic conditions, very, very cold. We go to uh, uh, tropical, where it's hot and humid, or we get hot and dry. All those elements will affect which way and which tool we use to protect against water ingress, etc. And this, uh, this slide just gives us an example of the technology advances Technology advances of connectors and the technology advances of what tool, what equipment we use. For example, I've indicated here an, uh, 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 the use of Scotch 3M tape. Two types of 3M tape, one which gives us a good electrical uh, uh, insulation properties, but another which gives us good insulation properties plus mechanical properties. The other aspect, how secure are our lights in the runway? I mean, traditionally, the suppliers have just said, oh, you put them in and we use bolt or a nut, stood on a nut, and you tighten them to so many uh, newton meters. Are they secure? And when we look at 
that when we look at the performance operation of a light fixture in a pavement on a runway, on a runway centre line, or particularly if they touch down zone, where the aircraft are landing, we have horizontal shear, we have a turning moment, and we have the dynamic load of the aircraft, all damaging or potentially damaging the pavement, but we've got lights in. Potentially damaging the lights. So are they secure? So here I've just used a, 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 a took a, we've got something called a smart light, a smart bolts now, smart bolts or smart nuts. And basically, uh, uh, when we when we tighten and we want to tighten the clamping force rather than the torque, the clamping force, when a, 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 a bolt or a nut comes loose, could we have an indication? Yes, we can. Technology enables us to do that now. Here I've got a demonstration of a, uh, a smart bolt where it is normally, when it is tightened at the correct uh, uh, tightness, then there is a black indication. I would like it to be green, but there's not enough airports use the capability today uh, to make it uh, commercially viable to change the black to, to a, a, a green uh, 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 indication. When the bolt comes loose, when to a predetermined uh, 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 condition that is coming loose, it took the, the indication turns red. We also add uh, washers. So uh, the, the washer, the, the way it was called the wedge lock, uh, lock and washer system, and uh, not going into the technical detail, what I'm saying is there are advantages rather than just a simple bolt and a washer to secure our lights into the into the into the base unit in the field. Whether or not we've got deep bases or whether we've got shallow bases is irrelevant. Now here we have the capability as an example. As an example. So when we're looking at, uh, at supporting tools and equipment, then what equipment? We've already said that AGL is an asset. So why not have an asset management, a, an effective asset management system that is able to collect data, analyze data, and present it to us in real time? Yes, we can. But it needs to be accurate data. So that CMMS, that Computer management, Maintenance Management System, that Asset Management System needs to collect data or have the ability to collect reliable data, analyze the data, and present it in a format that we want. So we can have work orders, etc. for example. It needs to be accurate, complete, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be repeatable, hence it's relevant. So an asset management is the way forward if we're going to manage maintenance. The capability is with you today. Why not utilize it? <clears throat> One of the aspects of, of uh, looking at light fixtures that are installed on the runway or the taxiway is to know where they are. Well, what we do, count them, go out there, oh, one, two, three, four, five. No, we don't. We can actually ID them now. ID them, and we can record that ID. We can use tags adjacent, so we can actually read the location, or we can do it using GPS. Mm. That's a bit of a wrong word to say. GPS is not that accurate, is it, in terms of dimension? location but when we add real-time kinematics to it rtk when we put a base station then we can get down to centimeter angles so we actually know where the equipment is when we're looking at and getting that information in real time then we can utilize the asset management tools that are available to us. And what I'll give this is uh, 
uh, uh, two presentations. And on the next slide is another two little slides that I chose, which Rob Billingham uh, presented in his uh, the asset management in the uh, uh, in the last two seminars in part one and part two. And uh, it's an effective maintenance management system, not just for AGL as a light a photometric output, but is it secure? Is it the, the, is, is the electrical system secure in terms of its performance? For example, insulation resistance, we can record that into, into an asset management system and present it in a format that we could understand it, in the form of a dashboard. This is the way forward. This is the way forward. But then it comes to us as people, the personnel, Technical training. Now, CBTA, computer-based training and assessment, is now mandated by ICAO, EASA in Europe, and many of the national authorities. I know we hear that uh, in Australia, CASA have issued an advisory circular on this very subject. But CBTA, CBT, computer-based, or yeah, competency-based training, some of them sometimes called computer-based training, but competency-based training has been around for a long, long, long time, since about the 1930s. That's a long, long, long time. It evolved, it evolved into objective training, where you define the objectives and train accordingly. But more recently, the CBTA is based upon evidence-based training. That's really assessment piece. So you don't just train the person, you assess the person as understood and is deemed to be competent. Now, ICAO issued a document during uh, the pandemic, uh, well, a revision of the document, a third edition, there was a part two, which is defined CBTA. <coughs> and it says that all personnel involved in aerodrome operations shall, I've highlighted that, shall receive appropriate training and assessment and records are kept associated with it. So you can demonstrate and justify competence. Many airports have said, well, it's, it's expensive, isn't it, to keep training people or update training. Well, if you think training is expensive, try an accident. And, and I took a, an in, a, a comment by Richard Branson, a virgin, and the statement was, what if we train people, our personnel, and they leave us. Training is, is expensive, or can be expensive, but my gosh, not as expensive as an accident. So what if we train a personnel and they leave? Well, Richard Branson said, well, what if we don't train them and they stay? So what is training, technical training? It's about knowledge, gaining knowledge, it's about applying that knowledge as a skill, whatever that stop function is, but the key issue is attitude. Why? We have to work out there in the open in all kinds of climatic conditions. Attitude is really, really important. So competency-based training is a combination of skills, knowledge, and attitudes required to perform tasks to the prescribed standard. The assessment in, uh, uh, with competency-based training is a systematic approach. We define the competencies and we train based upon those competencies and we measure the performance and assess. And if you want to be an AGL practitioner, then you need to justify that you get some kind of certification of competence. But there are different types of certifications. There's a license delivered by an authority. There is a certificate can be delivered by the, the uh, service provider, an airport, or a training academy, a training organization academy, or even a diploma from an academic institution. But they should be valid only for a period of time. Now, that validity period is not defined exactly. 
but a generic periodistic or refresher time is three years. I know from my aircraft engineering background, uh, which I came from, is that if we were not working on an aircraft electrical system, in that particular model of aircraft, for two years, we'd have to go for a train, refresher training. So a three-year cycle is nominally, nominally, a logical time scale for refresher training. If your organization is ISO 9001, did you know that defines competency training? It defines in section 7.2 co a competency matrix, a training plan, competency evaluation. It's already there. Now on the right hand side is where uh, TMS Training Solutions on the International Theatre are offering competency-based training and assessment. And, uh, and so it's available for you to, uh, if you want a copy of the, the document associated with that, we can deliver it to you. But uh, yeah, ISO 9001 states you shall be competent. So that's uh, really an introduction, really, to uh, uh, to the intelligent airfield. Really, in the intelligent airfield, it's using equipment, tools, processes, people associated to take us into the next generation of safe aircraft operations. So we're going to go to the uh, a Q and A. So Tony, I mentioned earlier, uh, and Carl, um, who's with us. Uh, myself, uh, Kevin, and Tony, uh, we're available to, to answer questions. But also, what I would like is if you send those questions, send questions in, because I don't think we, we have time to cover every single question that potentially could come up. But we will actually, if you could send them in in writing, uh, then we will endeavor to, uh, endeavor to, to answer and support you in those uh, with our answers. So, uh, shall we uh, shall we receive any uh, things? Right. So, uh, I think Robert. Uh, I, I think maybe you can uh, maybe join back in now. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Thank, thank you, Keith. Uh, if you could drop the slide, if you could drop this the slide presentation, then we'll uh, reveal the panel in their full full splendor. Okay. Um, so I'll stop the share. I'd like to thank you, Keith, for an excellent presentation. Very informative. It's uh, always fun. It's very good to kind of listen through the uh, to to go through the structure of you know of of, of a presentation. It's very thought provoking. Um, when we're talking about uh, intelligent airfield operations, we think about how that intelligence has has got has has really gone through every aspect of what we're doing. And on and it's and like like everything in in this life, uh, it's on a, it's on a journey. So we've we've gone from if I look at our field of photometric testing uh, as a, as a, as a key area, um, we we know in in the past uh, in the past there was no testing of measurement of the light as such available. Um, the mon the uh, the mon the monitoring was uh, based on you know the, was based on the uh, the, the 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 maintenance the maintenance was based on fix on failure or block change so it was either um, reactive or uh, or you know the block change method very expensive um, monitoring was visual inspections and managing was was scheduling the block change or or the re, you know the reactive maintenance so and the inspections so we've come a long way now with technology. And this is just an example of photometric testing, which now is the data is collected electronically. You do your plan preventative maintenance based on analysis of the data. You monitor the you monitor the trends, and then you use that to manage the whole the whole system in a, in a perpetual circle. And that whether you're looking at whether you're looking now um, at training uh, at all of the equipment, all of the assets um, is how we do stuff and uh, and audits. I hadn't given much thought to to audits, but I can see um, audits as a key element of the quality assurance process, as you 
as you're pointing out there, Keith, um, and um, um, and 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 very valuable. And the 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 key thing being in an independent view because you have you have an um a kind of a a fresh pair of eyes looking at what is going on. Um, hopefully, those eyes are, are, are benefiting from the experience of having seen multiple parallel situations and to bring that experience to bear to the benefit of the assets and ultimately the airport in question. So, um, uh, Tony, if I could start with you, um, you you must have seen a, an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, change in this particular area from the, you know, as a scientist, having, having really begun the process of uh, uh, intelligent airfield operations. Uh, you saw you saw an airfield at its most basic level, didn't you, Tony? Yes, I mean, this is a story that uh, um, is probably about 50 years long. It starts in the 1970s when uh, I was uh, doing research to uh, develop taxiway lighting to meet the requirements of, of them, the new demanding aircraft. In other words, two, or really, the 747 and Concorde that brought new uh, requirements at the same time as the operational visibilities, low visibilities to be operated, were being reduced. And in the 1970s, we're in the era when they're beginning to move from uh, what was fairly general as the limit uh, a 200 foot cloud base and a half mile or 800 meter RVR to uh, because we're now getting equipment that could uh, control the aircraft to either to a low height and eventually to an automatic landing where the visibilities were much uh, lower. And so when you came to taxiway, of course, uh, the distance ahead of the aircraft, the pilot could see was much reduced. Um, the necessity of keeping the traffic moving in ground movement was important. The runway occupancy uh, becomes a key parameter. Once once a uh, significant number of airlines start offering all weather operations, uh, the, 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 the sort of taxiway side needed to uh, respond. So there was a need to develop new lighting, both uh, intensities, beam spreads, things like that, but also patterns. And uh, a lot of work was done um, in the 19, mid-1970s to define these parameters. And uh, in the course of that work, I did some surveys of airports to find out what was the, where were we starting from and was horrified to find the, the standard uh, and then inset taxi air lights it was supposed to be 30 candelas omnidirectional. You were lucky to find three candelas uh, in practice. Um, so I then also looked at the runways. Runways had, had been certified by a flight test as, as uh, complying with the life signal requirements and found just the same there. Nothing where anywhere near the 100% that ICAO specifies as being the minimum that should be available, often uh, as little as 5 or 10%. And yet, um, visual inspection had said this was adequate. So uh, that took me to back to the Civil Aviation Authority and pointed this out to them. Um, and actually, uh, did laboratory tests back at our research airfield with a very simple monitoring system, a number of photocells, a vertical array, on the back of a, a vehicle just driving up. You could capture uh, data that way, not have runway occupancy too long, keep it short. And uh, it took a long time, but eventually the CAA in the UK uh, grasped, grasped the issue and uh, funded the research um, with me monitoring it that led to uh, the foundation of TMS and uh, the beginning of all we've got today. So it's it's all very pleasing to see um, the where we've got to now. It was necessary in those days. Um, 
when you're in fact in those days it seemed to be the only reason the only um uh qualification to at most airports to maintain the airfield lighting was that so the person who was uh, appointed uh had basic electrical engineering skills and maybe if you're lucky it worked on something like um, street lighting and that, that no understanding of the aviation business at all and relying simply on lamp as you said earlier Robert lamp outage are, are the lights on and I could tell you some horrifying stories about that but uh, I think it's time I stop rambling on let somebody ask some other questions no no that's a, that's a very valuable insight Tony uh thank you thank you very much for that it's because um yeah, with uh, and it's very relevant looking at the uh, we had a question here um um asking about the challenges of keeping date AGL data up to date for, for real time reporting and how do we overcome them there's a you know what you know it's there's a lot of data out there um and um whether it's data from the equipment the telemetry whether it's the data we collect uh from 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 directly from the systems um, or the or the or the from the observations or the measurement equipment we use and how we use it. Um, that's where I guess uh, well, so so how do you know how do you know, you know if you're running there's a lot of people here responsible with very busy jobs, running airport operations day to day, big teams of people, huge challenges. Um, how do they how how do they weigh how do they make where do they start? You know, what where, where do you how do you advise them to go about this tr transformation to the digital world, the the intelligent airfield? I see. I see. Seward has joined us there. I could. I could put. I could throw. I could throw you under the bus, Seward. <laughs> Where do we start? Uh, you're asking me. I am uh, asking. Robert. Yeah. I, yeah. I tell you, I, I'm. The, the presentation was excellent. The presentation was excellent. And where we start is probably where we have started over here in, in the FAA world. It's it's different. And uh, what we need here is basically the requirement to do the testing and gather the data required. And we need to do that. And so many airports do not do that or they don't have the incentive to do that. They don't uh, they don't feel that it's a requirement of them to keep the thing safe. Uh, I don't know how to say that any different, but uh, but we need the training. We've started with training over here. We've started with training airports, but when airports come to maintaining their system, it costs them money, like it was uh, Keith indicated. It costs money, and uh, many are reluctant to spend the money. And they're reluctant to spend the money because they have no other source but their own pockets for primarily. And secondly, there's no requirement enforced for them to do the testing and maintenance as required that we're teaching now over here. That's the saddest thing to me is that we have no requirement that's enforced. When a cert inspector comes to your airport and looks at the lights and says, turn them on all five levels of intensity, you go click, 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 click. Okay, thanks. They work. Now we've got to get away from that, and it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous job. And I know Carl is working on that here in the states. But we got a real problem of financing the testing, monitoring the testing, and then making people aware that they got to do it. There is no requirement that says you shall do this, and if you don't, your certification is in danger. That's a summary. And the lead is great. I think the presentation was excellent. The potential is great, uh, what we can do. But uh, we've got to convince those in that regulate over here that it's got to be done and we got to enforce it. Uh, yeah, you that's... steal Keith's quote and start telling the, uh, the folks that uh, if you think training is expensive, how much is it actually going to cost? That's that was true. part of the emphasis was put on our class training was how much money they would spend on a single accident was monumentally more than what the uh, the training in the PP was worth. That's that's very that's very yeah very very uh, yeah. important. Uh, the the I was I one uh, aspect I, one aspect in the UK which really came to the attention a few years ago 
was really in the rail industry when we had something called gauge corner gauge corner, uh, uh, corner cracking on railway lines and there were some accidents and out of that came corporate manslaughter to those persons who were involved uh, uh, in the management of not doing the inspections. So until the law, until the regulatory authorities uh, start to take actually legal action, it's going to be very, very difficult. As an old colleague of mine always said to me, ah, this is Keith, he's my English mate. He changes the bulbs on the airfield. Yeah, that's what I do, I used to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, Keith, Keith, um, and and Carl, I I was at a, very fortunate to be at a presentation last week at Canadian Electrical Workshop in, and they had uh, a, a a gentleman by the name of Josh Colsty who presented on on their their maintenance journey, and they started uh, they started uh, the the management of their airfield lighting system digitally, uh, intelligently. Um, um, a few of in in the in about 2015 2016 and he very eloquently told the story of how they started off very skeptically saying well this is going to cost us additional resources money um and it's going to be very difficult and it's not it's a way it, you know it's just going to give us more work and we're not going to get anywhere and then he showed the results of their efforts over their journey over the last uh, eight to eight or nine years, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask him to present a TMS Tuesday on this. I hope he will. I'll just show that exact same presentation because this showed quite clearly what can be achieved. How you can actually improve your airport, make it compliant. And by the way, compliant is not discretionary. It's not something you can say. It's expensive. I don't want to do it. It's a requirement. If you're an airport, you must be compliant. Uh, so you can you can actually he he will give a I hope a practical uh, presentation demonstrating how you can make that journey, how you can save money, become compliant. And by the way, uh, Halifax Stansfield Airport uh, for all that attended Canu, it we had a day's training on the airfield split among a range of areas and it's such an impressive airfield the operations there the management the uh, the, the place is a, a shining example of, of how how what an airport can do and and not only is it compliant but it's it's actually much more efficient for to boot so um, I hope I can arrange that very in the very near future um okay um I have. We've. Uh, I also just would like to make a. You know, congratulate uh, Kevin and Tony on this call today, Tony Coates, um, because um, they have. Uh, they've. Uh, they've engaged in uh, becoming ICAO certified trainers in the last week, and I'd like to congratulate them both on on this on this formal accreditation uh, and the excellent work and what it brings to our team, um, because. Um, because now with the, you know, the, it, it is absolutely necessary, as Tony has explained, you know, it's a part of the regulatory framework, it's a requirement that we are competent, that we undergo regular training, including updates to, you know, to, to, to keep familiar with what's going on in our ever more intelligent world. And um, so, um, and and the, the structure of the training is being, is being increasingly regulated and rightly so. Um, and so congratulations to you both. Well done. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I think that wraps it up really for this week. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. Um, have you back after the summer break. Uh, we're back, I think it's the 29th of October. Is that right, Damon? Mm, yes, that's correct, Robert. Good. Thank you, Damon, for the city. So keep the date free. Two o'clock UK time. We'll send out all the information, but on the 29th of October, we look forward to inviting you all back. If you've got, you know, we will, the questions we haven't specifically addressed, we will, uh, we will, we, the, the questions you haven't specifically uh, 
we haven't specifically answered we will get back to you online and um, thank you for your interest your time uh, without you this wouldn't be possible and i really appreciate it thank you to all the panelists and special thanks to keith for making today's presentation and of course damon and felicity who arrange all this so thank you very much i wish you a very very enjoyable october and see you back here on the 29th cheerio thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.